I'm petrified of this dating app, Tinder. It provides the golden opportunity for stalking and harming people. Tinder just gives the creeps out there an easy way out, I believe, and I have enough evidence to support my accusation. I live with my roommate, Tony, who is a naive and whimsical guy. He has a good heart and sometimes is too good for this world. Tony, Cameron, and I are the trio in our college. Many addressed us as the three musketeers as we are always hanging out with each other. Cameron stayed in an apartment two blocks away from ours with his girlfriend, Riley. Riley hosted many parties, so on weekends, Tony and I used to chill out at their place. Tony was shy when it came to talking to girls, and all our friends often mocked him for it. One Saturday evening, we were watching a football game at Cameron's place. Riley was having a sleepover at his sister's house, so it was just the three of us. Cameron handed Tony a beer and said, Dude, you should try Tinder. I don't know. I, I chicken out in front of girls. That's why Tinder will be perfect for you. Talk to her as long as she doesn't ask you to meet her. At least you'll get laid for once. <laughs> I too laughed hearing this. And within the next few hours, Cameron forcefully installed Tinder on Tony's phone. We made him an account, and that's how this entire prank started. The entire night, we made fun of him and then drank ourselves to sleep. The next morning when I woke up, I found myself lying on the floor with a massive headache. Tony was passed out on the couch and Cameron came out from the kitchen with a mug of hot coffee. Drink this, you'll be fine. <sighs> last night was too much. I did something last night, but you can't tell Tony, promise me. What, what did you do? I created a fake account and matched it with Tony's. <laughs> now when he will wake up, he will meet Sarah. <laughs> We can have some fun for a while. Man, I don't think that's nice. You know how naive he is. What if this little joke ends up being a big mistake? Oh, come on. We will tell him later. Relax. Nothing will go wrong. After that day, Cameron started to text Tony from his fake Sarah account. And for a while, Tony too couldn't believe his luck. We were sitting in the college canteen one afternoon when Cameron asked, So... How is it going between you and Sarah? Can't tell. She texts me at random times and her profile picture doesn't show her face. Who wants to see her face? Shut up, Cameron. I just wish I could meet her and talk to her in person. Well, I think that will be too early. You guys just started talking. And like I said, wait for her to ask you out. Really? What do you think, Matthew? I hesitated because now... I will have to make up something too. Um, yeah, you should wait for her to make the move. Okay, if you guys say so. After this interaction in the cafeteria, I pulled Cameron aside in the hallway. Cameron, what the hell are you doing? Just end this and tell Tony the truth. Jeez, you are getting on my nerves. Fine, I'll tell him tonight. I came home thinking, if Cameron doesn't tell Tony the truth tonight, then I will. I took a shower and heard Tony's phone beeping with messages. Damn, he is still pulling this weird shit out. I then went out to pick up our dinner from the Chinese place nearby when Tony called me. Hey, what is it? Um, did you take the keys? No, why? I have to go out. Sarah texted me that she wants to meet me at the city park. Now? Oh, I see. I knew this was Cameron's showdown, so I went on with his prank for one last time. I told Tony to leave the keys under the mattress. He thanked me and left to make a fool of himself. As soon as I got off the phone with Tony, I dialed Cameron to give him a final warning, but he didn't pick up my call. Realizing he was ignoring me, I called his girlfriend Riley. As she answered, I couldn't hold myself anymore. Riley, please tell Cameron to stop this nonsense. Why did he tell Tony to go to the city park? How long is he going to stretch this stupid prank? Whoa, whoa, slow down, Matthew. What are you saying? Cameron didn't say anything like that to Tony. You don't know? He is using a fake profile in Tinder to make fun of Tony. He just texted Tony. Please, just let me talk to him. No, you're not getting it. Cameron can't text Tony or anyone because he just lost his phone while coming home. Someone stole his phone during his bus ride. That dumbass didn't even put a lock on his phone. He's gone to the police station to file a complaint. There's no way he can contact Tony. Wait. Does that mean the person who has his phone? Oh my God! I didn't let Riley finish and started to run in the direction of the park. 
It was 7.30 already, and I was very well aware of how stranded the park gets after dark. Whoever stole Cameron's phone is now trying to trap Tony using his fake Tinder account. I tried calling Tony again and again, but my call was going straight to his voicemail. I prayed to God for his safety. I wasn't looking anywhere, just pushing people away from my way and running at full speed. Within seven minutes, I reached the park gate. There was no one around. I started to look around in that huge deserted park. Tony! Tony, where are you? I was calling out to him, but I heard nothing back. I must have searched for a minute when I heard voices coming from a distance. I slowly tiptoed to a bush and peeked in. What I saw made my heart skip a beat. Tony was lying unconscious on the ground under a tree and a man was lunged over him. There was a big scar on Tony's forehead and a bloody rock was lying next to him. It seemed like this man hit him on the head unexpectedly. The man seemed very weird and freaky. He was staring at Tony's face with a hungry look. At the first glance, I thought he was probably planning to rob my friend, but what he did next made me nauseous. He inserted his fingers inside his drooling mouth and dipped them in his sloppy saliva. But he didn't just stop there. He then shoved his spit-covered fingers inside my unconscious friend's mouth and started to enjoy every moment of it. His face clearly showed his sick intentions that crowded his mind quite immediately. After gazing at my unconscious friend for a few seconds, he started to unbutton Tony's shirt while whispering, I can be your Sarah. I can give you all the love you'll ever need. He then ran his filthy fingers over Tony's bare chest and went close to kiss him on the lips. By now, I figured out that this man had no weapon. Without wasting any more time, I jumped at this man and pushed him away from my friend. Keep your filthy hands off my friend, you jerk! <laughs> the man couldn't keep his balance and slipped on the rock falling hard on his face. I heard his nose break as he hit the rocky ground. He started screaming in terrible pain while holding his bloody nose. His screams woke Tony up. Also, a patrolling security guard came running towards us. I explained to him everything, and he called the cops while keeping an eye on that man. What... what happened? Where am I? It's all right. I'm here. Can you walk? I... I think so. Why is my shirt unbuttoned? And who is this guy? I'll tell you later. For now... It's enough to know that this man deserves this. Let's go. The man sat quietly until the cops came. His eyes were burning with anger, but he knew I was stronger than him. I helped Tony to get up and then took him to the nearest hospital. Cameron and Riley came within some time after I called them and told them everything. Cameron apologized to Tony and was about to cry for doing this silly prank. I gave him his phone back, which I picked up from the ground when that freak slipped and fell. I am just happy that I reached him in time before that man had done something more damaging to my friend. Tony has become even more reserved now. I know it will take time to get out of this trauma, but whenever he asks me what that man was doing after he passed out, I tell him he was trying to rob him and nothing else. I will never tell him what kind of sick and twisted thoughts that man had for Tony that night. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the video. If so, please leave a like. 
And also, a small percentage of people that watch my videos are actually subscribed. If you want to support this channel and make this channel reach the 1 million mark, please consider subscribing. It's free and you can change your mind later. Enjoy. This is the shocking story of a girl named Grace Mullane, who disappeared on the day before her birthday. Grace was from Wickford, Essex. After graduating from the University of Lincoln with a bachelor's degree in advertising and marketing, she set out on a backpacking tour. It was her long-needed break, so she planned to make the most of it. She went to stay in New Zealand for two weeks after spending six weeks in South America. Excited about turning 22, Grace was on cloud nine. She traveled around the Upper North Island and then arrived in Auckland on 30th November. Being on her solo trip and having adventures in mind, she decided to go out and explore the place in her way. She was having a time of her life until she met a guy on Tinder named Jesse Shane Kempson. They both matched and started to talk. Kempson asked her out quite immediately and Grace was stunned to see how persuasive he was. The 27-year-old sent the first message on the dating app saying, Hey Grace, how are you? Much planned for the weekend? She responded after a couple of minutes. Hey, I'm good, thanks. And it's my birthday tomorrow, but I have no plans. Keen to know what Grace was up to in the evening, he replied, Oh shit, happy birthday for tomorrow. Much planned for this evening then? Haha, <laughs> thank you, I haven't. Kimpson then asked the backpacker if she wants a drink, and she replied, mm, Yeah, maybe. Maybe yes? Convince me. Seeing this, Kimpson gave her a pretty weird reply saying, <laughs> Well, my shout. <laughs> Grace didn't understand and asks what he is trying to say. Kimpson then clarifies that he would like to pay for the drinks, that signifying the outing will be his treat. Grace then asked Kimpson where they would go, and he says he knows a cool Mexican place up near Sky City that does great cocktails. Not being a fan of Mexican food, Grace replied, Okay, no to Mexican, but maybe to the cocktails. Just a minute later, Kimpson started to appear very pushy. He said, Okay, there's a few places up there that do great cocktails. How about we meet at Sky City? Getting startled with this persuasive behavior, Grace politely asked, But I haven't said yes yet. Kimpson still kept pushing her for meeting up, saying, You haven't said either. So what's it going to take to make this happen then? Realizing his pushover nature might screw up the date, he promptly added how nice it would be to spend some time on the night before her birthday. She then told him she only brought casual clothes with her, to which he said, is fine. At almost 3 a.m., Grace finally agreed to the plan of meeting Kimpson and asked him to add her on Facebook. Kimpson got what he wanted, and Grace didn't realize what horrible nightmare was waiting for her on the night before her birthday. She had no idea that eight months before, Kimpson had brutally raped another British tourist. In this CCTV camera footage, Kimpson can be seen waiting for Grace. Grace finally met him, and then they went to the mall, to a pub, and the last few seconds of this footage, they were seen getting into his hostel to go to his room. Grace and Kimpson got into the elevator, and that was the last time Grace was seen alive. What happened next can only be described as grotesque, shocking, and terrifying. Malane's parents became concerned after she did not reply to the birthday wishes they sent on the 2nd December 2018. Grace, far from home, about to celebrate her 22nd birthday, had willingly gone to his hostel room. Until she entered the lift to his apartment, she appeared to have been enjoying her night. Hours earlier, she had messaged her friend during a Tinder date with the killer, telling her it would be the last communication she would have with the friends and family she had left behind in Britain those who loved her so much. It was this one act that led police right to him. Soon after 9.30 p.m., the footage shows them leaving and heading to the lobby of the City Life Hotel, where they enter the lift, the killer fumbling for his key card as they head towards room 308. What exactly happened in that room was not hard to guess after that. Being a psychopath and deranged-minded person, Kimpson assaulted her and then strangled her to death. He also took seven intimate photographs of Grace's dead body, including close-ups manipulating the body to get the shots he wanted. The following morning, with Grace still lying dead in room 308, he texted another woman he had met on Tinder, trying to arrange a date for later that day. Shortly after, 
he was again caught on CCTV buying a suitcase. And this is where the murder takes an even shocking turn. Kipson bought a suitcase and put the victim's body inside to get rid of it later. The footage that was found from the CCTV camera is enough to make your skin crawl. Kimson is seen carrying it casually. People around him had no idea that inside that suitcase lies the dead body of a sweet, innocent girl who was murdered on the night before her birthday. Footage shows him going from his room to a leisure store to buy an identical suitcase, then to a supermarket to buy some cleaning products, and then to a car hire firm. He rented a red Toyota hatchback car and, as Grace lay dead in his hotel room, headed out in the afternoon to meet up with the other woman he had been texting earlier in the day at a bar in the trendy Auckland suburb of Ponsonby. In the meantime, the police acquired all the CCTV footage and understood he is the one behind Grace's disappearance. Even though he lied at first to the police, but by the time of his second interview, he had no choice but to admit to killing Grace. He said that he choked her and had no remorse for the devilish acts he did to this poor girl. The jury found him guilty. During his trial, he was described as a sociopath who made some of the women he met or communicated with on Tinder highly uncomfortable. It later emerged that he took another British tourist out on a Tinder date before bringing her back to his Auckland motel room eight months before he killed Grace. Kimpson raped the tourist, then 21, while she lay on the bed crying and frozen with fear after she refused to have intercourse with him. She kept the attack secret until she recognized Kempson from the media coverage the day he was charged with Grace's murder. For many months, his identity was protected by the justice process in New Zealand, but that was finally removed when he lost an appeal against his conviction and sentenced for murdering Grace. He was jailed for 17 years to run concurrently with the other two sentences of 11 years. It was late night when I got an alert on my phone. I could not believe it. I had just matched on Tinder with the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen. She was a 21-year-old blonde called Valerie. I didn't think much of it at the time, but I should have suspected that something was up right from the get-go. I'm not what you'd usually consider attractive, not like the other guys on Tinder. I look normal. If I were hanging out at a bar and I strike up a conversation with someone, I think I'd have a decent shot at any girl there, but on these dating apps, it's all about the looks. And a decent six like me doesn't usually match with a glowing 10. And it's even stranger when it's her making the first move. Hey, handsome. Nice pics. I replied immediately, surprised that she'd be the first to break the ice, and we started talking. Turns out we were attending the same university, and even though she was a medical student, our schedules were pretty similar. After a few days of great, long conversations, I finally went for it and asked her out for coffee. She said yes, and we met that Friday after school. I met Valerie in a bookshop cafe near campus. She looked as stunning as she did in her profile, and she was just as charming. It was summer, and she was wearing a nice sundress that nicely complimented her figure. But what caught my attention mostly was the strange necklace she wore. It had a strange circular symbol with small blue rocks embedded into it. When I asked about it, she sort of dodged the question. Ugh, this old thing? It belonged to my grandmother, but I don't want to talk about it. She looked nervous for a second, but then she went back to her usual charming self. We kept talking, having fun with stories about school, when I noticed a man on a far table staring at us. No, staring at me. The man had a strange-looking face. It was weird that I hadn't noticed him until then. He was wearing all black, and I couldn't really tell from a distance, but it looked like he was wearing a necklace and it looked similar to Valerie's. He had half his face scarfed as if he'd been terribly burnt and he really looked out of place in the cafe. When he realized I was staring at him, he looked down to his phone, but later I caught him staring at me several times. I was kind of freaked out, so I decided to cut it short. I was feeling very strange. Valerie was nice, maybe too nice, and this other guy, was really intimidating. So I made an excuse and left. Before leaving the cafe, Valerie gave me her Instagram and asked me to follow her. So I did. On my way home, I scrolled through her feed. If I didn't know she was a medical student, I'd assume she was a supermodel by the looks of her feed. Many, many provocative pictures, and she always looked great on all of them. Later that night, 
She texted me. Hey, it was weird the way you left today. I hope I didn't do anything to upset you. I replied that I was okay. I was just feeling a little strange and had to get out of there. But that she was great and that I'd love to see her again. Oh, great, because I know it's kind of too soon for a second date, but a friend is playing a show with her band tonight and I'm looking for a plus one. Would you be interested? I could not resist. I said yes and began putting together an outfit. I left that night and I saw something strange outside of my apartment, a black SUV, and the man at the wheel was looking at me. I didn't get a good look at him. It was too dark and he pulled up the window when he caught me staring. I began walking to the bus stop. I could swear someone was following me. I'd hear steps behind me, rushing suddenly, only to turn around and see no one there. I looked back at my building and the SUV had disappeared, but I never heard the engine. I told myself I was imagining things. The bus arrived and I got on. And that's when I realized that something terrible was going to happen. Valerie was standing there in the bus between the row of seats. I was shocked to see her. That was a coincidence, right? I turned and looked, and the bus driver was the guy, the same guy from the coffee shop, with his horribly scarred face and a terrible smile on his lips. Valerie said, I'm so glad you made it. She had a sickening grin on her face. There were other people in the bus, all men, all wearing black and with the same necklace she had around their necks. Suddenly, I felt the urge to run, to jump, but the bus was on the move and someone was behind me. One of the men grabbed me and Valerie walked up to me with a needle in her hand. She stabbed me with it and everything went black. I woke up in a dark room. I could hear people chanting in some weird language in the distance. The room had wooden walls and there was a carving of the same symbol in the necklace they all wore. I had been kidnapped by some strange cult. I had to get out of there. A knock came at the door. It was Valerie. She was wearing a dark robe now, and her hair had strands of red wet with blood. She was holding a bloody knife, too, as if she'd just killed someone. The mother will be ready for you soon, she said and walked away, shutting the door behind her. I was trembling with fear, but I wouldn't let these psychos kill me just like that. I explored the room carefully. It had no windows and it was almost empty. I inspected the wood on the walls. There were several boards placed vertically, one next to the other. I fiddled with them until I noticed one in particular was kind of flimsy. I pulled on it gently, and I was able to pull it back a little. The wall inside was hollow, and the space was just enough for me since I was so skinny. I managed to pull the plank all the way without breaking it, and I got inside the wall. Then I pulled the plank back in place. About 20 minutes later, I heard the door open, and then shouting. A male voice said, where is he? Valerie was also there. He was right here, I swear. Spread out and find him. Mother will be angry if we let anyone go. The man said, and soon everyone had abandoned the room. But I didn't hear the door close. I waited a minute and exited the wall. As I suspected, the door was open. But I could hear people coming and going outside. I exited the room and found another door open down the hall. I got in and I found it was some sort of storage room. There were robes and books there. I took a robe and disguised myself as one of them. I also saw there were several knives and other objects I could use to defend myself. So I took a small blade. It would work. I had never hurt anyone before, but I was decided to escape that place. I went outside. I had the knife hidden in my sleeve. The house looked like an old manor. The kind you see in old-timey horror movies. And there was so much chaos around that nobody seemed to mind me. There were people in robes running up and down the hallways, so I tried to imitate them, keeping my head low under the hood of my cloak and grasping the knife tight. I started making my way down a huge staircase. I could see the front door of the house. I was about to escape when I heard a shout behind me. It was her. I turned around and there was an old lady behind Valerie. I suppose that's the mother, but I had no time to find out. I rushed to the door and made it outside with what seemed to be all members of the cult following me. I saw there were expensive cars parked outside. Some of them looked like European models. These people, whoever they were, had money. 
there was a man smoking a cigarette next to one of the sports cars. The car's door was open. So I threatened him with the knife until he gave me the keys. I got into the driver's seat and broke through the front gates. I could hear the other cars behind me, but this thing was fast, so I quickly lost them. After all that happened, I moved back across the country. I decided to stay with some relatives for a while. I went to the cops, but they told me that when they went to the house, it looked like it had been abandoned years ago. I told them it couldn't be because it was full of people, but they assured me that there was nothing wrong. To this day, part of me is always looking over my shoulder, hoping the cult never catches up to me. I know they're still out there. All I know for certain is this. I'm never going anywhere near those damn apps ever again. <laughs>